a whole new series that we're doing in the divine will components of the Carmelite model of the spiritual journey and how the divine will, the language of it and the journey of the divine will modifies but also builds upon those very elements. Welcome once again to Bite by Bite, a journey into the gift of the divine will. We're here in this wonderful ongoing conversation about how to sew together the Carmelite tradition and the psychological development of our souls, as we as humans, in the divine will. And so we're on episode 31 tonight, as we continue this journey of prayer, that we talk about this process that God is drawing us into. This is all his grace. This is all his idea. And <laughs> as he's given us this wonderful gift of the divine will, the process still has to happen within us. But now, expedited by the fact that it's Jesus doing this process in us, this formation in prayer, this process of drawing us into love and relationship with him, helping us let go of those things which are separated from him, ourself, the, the ego and the human will, and how he is doing that as we pray. And tonight we'll be looking specifically at how this process is happening now through mental prayer, even moving to a place where God is now preparing for him to come and be with us, which we call uh, acquired recollection. We'll see how that works. But I'm Larry Leopold. I'm a Carmelite and I'm a spiritual director. And I'm with Dr. Lois Grundy, who is also a Carmelite and a certified counselor and therapist and psychological expert, especially on early childhood trauma. And she loves the divine will. Isn't that great? So together, we're just here to let Lois share the great wisdom she has, as she has studied so much of both about the soul and the psyche, and how we're now putting them together in this great journey. Lois, welcome. I'm, I'm wondering if you could lead us in the prayer tonight as we try to let the Holy Spirit speak through us. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Father, we come before you in Jesus' name, fusing our will with your divine will. And we're asking this night for a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit and thanking him for his help and his guidance and his inspiration, everything that he is in our life. And we're asking him to be poured out, and especially through the prayers of the mother of the divine will and the mother of Carmel, <clears throat> Our Lady especially through the prayers of his spouse. We ask little Louisa, little Therese, St. Joseph, all of our friends to pray for us. And we ask the Holy Spirit to be again poured out in joy, in light, in truth, and witness to our hearts how much, please witness to our hearts how much we are uncommonly loved, as Elizabeth of the Trinity would say. Amen. 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 And so, as you recall last week, uh, we were talking about just the initiation of this process as we, almost like kindergartners, are learning the language of God and the language of love through vocal prayer and how the very use of our vocal cords and the speech centers helps inform our intellect as to what, what's going on, who God is. And we start by this simple process that God's grace is now drawing us from our minds and now deeper into our hearts. So that we're not just saying the words faithfully and devotedly, but, but starting to experience it. the beginnings of relationship, isn't it? Talk to us about how God's way is, is one of love and relationship, please. And how this next step, what is it doing in us? As you were saying, we'll just... Um review very briefly the three kinds of prayer we were talking about vocal prayer which all of you are familiar with and meditation which most people are probably familiar with and then mental prayer contemplative prayer which i think a lot of people are familiar with maybe not as familiar right and we're talking about vocal prayer and teresa avila says something interesting she says if you're doing vocal prayer 
and you're really focusing, and I'm paraphrasing, if you're really focusing on who God is and who you're talking to, and you're doing that vocal prayer very slowly, very meditatively <laughs> in that way, and really thinking about it, then God can raise you even in that prayer to what we call an infused prayer, which for the moment, I'll just say, all it means is that you're praying in your human mode. You're praying the best you can. And Jesus comes along in a supernatural way and gives you just that little bit of extra help with the prayer. And when I say help, I mean you might get a deeper insight with what you're praying about. Like even if you just begin the Our Father and say Our Father, you might get a deeper insight what that really means, that God is our Father, right? And you might get uh, a sense of joy, a sense of closeness to Jesus. And that's what I mean by Jesus coming along, entering the prayer a little bit, right? Maybe mingling with it uh, so that he can give us these gifts that, Larry, that you just talked about that draw us to the heart of Jesus, because ultimately, we want prayer to bring us into communion with the heart of Jesus, to bring our heart into communion with his heart, heart to heart, spirit to spirit, right? And that's what prayer is about. It's about um, being brought into a relationship with the one to whom we are addressing the prayer, with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All right, and I like how we, you know, had tried to draw that the allegory between our human love relationships of of meeting that that special someone, right? Maybe getting struck at love at first sight, or maybe just being interested, going out for a cup of coffee, and then mm -hmm. finding that you have so much in common. And there's just something drawing you there, and the more you converse and discover. Um, not just about them, but how you resonate. And there's a discovery of self in this mm -hmm. journey of love. Mm -hmm. How do we how do we tie that into this divine love affair? That that now we have these faculties of of imagination and and uh, our our heart and all. How do they how do they help us find our way to discover who God is and in the process who we are? Okay. We'll start with baptism. <laughs> at, at oh, bat back to the beginning. <laughs> at baptism, we are given gifts to be a Christian. We are giving an um, inclination toward the Lord. And it's interesting because with the fall of Adam, as we've talked about so many times, we um, inherit an inclination toward sin, toward brokenness. With baptism, we are giving, we inherit, if you will, our true inheritance, which is a desire and an inclination to go toward God, faith, hope, and love, the theological virtues. And what we're talking about now in this prayer is at some point in our life, we may hear a um, discern a deeper call of Jesus saying, come spend time with me, right? I want to spend time with you. We're hearing that deeper call. And so what we're doing is we're trying to figure out, wow, I'm I'm being pulled, I'm being drawn to, to come and spend time with Jesus. Who is this? Who is this that's drawing me? And this is really just a release of those gifts that we got in baptism and the gifts were confirmed and strengthened in confirmation. So this now, this feeling that you want to go toward God and spend time with him and find a way of working out, how do we work out this relationship? What is this all about? What is he calling to me? me to? That is a gift in your heart that's been released. And that's for all Christians, right? Okay. So... So as you talk about this, I, I can't help but just think about how, how good it feels that when this happens, it feels good, right? Which is an interesting heart indication about the goodness that God is. 
yes. that he is the good underneath the good that we feel and that's our heart is drawn to that exactly. right we, we talk about him as light as life as goodness itself mm -hmm. and now and now he's he's activating parts of our heart exactly that have been kind of asleep haven't they there's an awakening that's a good way of putting an awakening of this desire it's an awakening of one's desire and again i think what we're intuiting what we're really just sensing we are, we, our spirit has senses too so what we're just sensing is we're sensing a couple of things we're sensing the draw to jesus the hunger the thirst it's like you just you get a feeling sometimes almost like okay this is the time in my life where i need to turn to the lord and get more serious about him this the time is now the time is here so you may feel that but then the other thing that you get an intimation out just a little sense of to begin with uh, most people little sense of to begin with and that is um entering the reality that this Jesus, that you're going to go and you're going to sit, you're going to kind of look at him and try to spend time with him and all that, is already and has been from all eternity looking at you, waiting for you to be created. Um, how can I put it? Excited about you in your life, hoping that you will use your free will to now come to him and follow him hoping that the plan, the gracious plan, the highest plan that he has for your life, you will learn how to collaborate with him and that plan will be fulfilled. All of these things, you're getting this intimation now. Wow, there's somebody on the other side that has been loving me forever. I don't know them fully yet. I don't know the depth of the love. That's going to be part of the journey, but they have something very special for me and also there is a great need. It's both. It's like, this is going to be special for me, drawing closer to the Lord, but also this is going to be special for my brothers and my sisters. So this, this grace, this thing that he planted within us that has now been awakened is him. It's him himself, mm -hmm. right? And and so as as it's awakening, it's him doing the awakening. Absolutely. But we have to cooperate with it, don't we? Exactly. Right? And the thing about the cooperation is later on, we'll be talking about a particular prayer, acquired recollection, where you learn more and more. Jesus teaches you and prepares you and heals you and frees you so that you can cooperate with him more. You know, the thing that, we, we might not always understand right away. I know I didn't, my goodness, not even close. And that is, I thought, if you're going to turn to God, you know, you just turn to God, you give your life, you follow him. That's pretty much what happens. And it didn't occur to me initially, I had to, to live through it, didn't occur to me that there are many things in all of us, again, those inclinations from the fall of Adam, Adam were broken we're broken people, broken race, that there are many, many things in us that are obstacles to us just turning to God and saying, okay, I'm yours, let's go, let's go on this journey. We have resident in us um, wounds and inclinations towards sin and residue from past sin, <laughs> all of it. And those would serve as an obstacle but instead of the Lord looking at us and saying, hey, clean yourself up, get rid of those, turn away from all your sin, then come, he's doing something quite different. He's saying, come, come to me, you who are heavily laden and burdened, and I will give you rest. And so he's saying, in prayer, come to me, and you can give me that. And the exchange for that is, I will give you rest. I will give okay. you rest. I will show you how to collaborate with me. Okay. Now I'm going to take you back a couple of weeks when you were sharing your story with us yeah. about that moment in your life. Right. Yeah. And I recall, if I'm not mistaken, that, that you were drawn 
to begin reading the scriptures and looking into different lives of saints and reading about the church. You were doing a lot of, of reading. And what was that reading doing within you? What was happening in that? And and that's the thing, you know, like people could think, oh, I, I, you know, my life was about studying and learning and getting degrees and all that kind of thing, right? So you could look at it and say, oh, well, Lois is just doing what she normally does. Just, okay, now I'm going to read all about Jesus. But it wasn't that way at all. This reading, the second group of reading that I did, one for my degree, <laughs> my degrees, and this second group wasn't motivated in that way at all. It was more like, um, it was so beautiful. It was more like, okay, I had a revelation of Jesus. We have an encounter. My encounter was through a dream, but it was quite incredible. And we had a conversation and that was quite incredible. <laughs> and then I'm like thrust back into my life. Like, okay, I'm here now. What do I do? And all, it was something that welled up inside of me. It was like, I have simply got to get to know this person that has shown me such mercy. Oh, that was it. I, I understood in that revelation, I understood um, that that this was a merciful intervention. This was this was God's mercy to me and to whoever. But this was God's mercy. The plan is God's mercy. And I I was filled with a just a sheer desire to find him again. And I couldn't find him again in the dreams and all you can't you can't make that happen. I couldn't like, you know, make him <laughs> show up in another dream or something. I couldn't do that. So it left me with this hunger. So I turned to reading and studying. And when I was reading and studying, and, and had it not been this way, I would have stopped, I think. But when I was reading and studying, it was what I shared earlier about the vocal prayer. I was reading. And as I was reading, I would stop and, and I would meditate. And very clearly, the Holy Spirit was there leading and guiding me um, to even the point, as I shared with you one time, Larry, one time I was reading something in Barclay, who's a, a non-Catholic theologian, but very famous and very expert. And I really heard the Lord say to me, it was something that was problematic to me. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> and I really heard the Lord say, Lois, don't worry about that. Just get what you can from it. You know, he was directing my reading. He was teaching me. He was talking to me through this whole process. And that enkindled my heart. But I still had that hunger and thirst, which, as I said, has lasted to this day. That hunger and thirst that cannot be satiated. And one of the things with the satiation is the more you have a hunger and thirst for God, the more it grows. It doesn't get satiated. It just grows. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know that initially, but it just a divine grows. addiction. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So so here we are. You're you're now you're now like updating in a sense with God. And and Joe, you want to know everything about him. And you're yes. finding everything you can find. But as you, the more you find, the more your heart is drawn to him. Yes. And, and you're finding out that your heart needs him. And you're discovering that about yourself. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. That was a big discovery, how wounded I was. I mean, I knew I was wounded. <laughs> I knew there had been things. My family was extremely wounded. <laughs> so, so there were lots of things here. But I had no no idea the degree and the depth and how those wounds go so much down to your soul to where when you can't appropriately love yourself and love yourself in a happy way, in a healthy way, it just colors your whole world. It, it's, it's a major thing. And one time, um, as I shared too, I was going through something and Joseph just said, you know what it is? And I said, no, what is it? He goes, you don't love you enough yet. And and that was just exactly it. You know, he was telling me exactly where the Lord was working in my heart. It was like, I hadn't learned to love me because 
when you're wounded and you go through these things that are shameful, you're covered in shame. And that shame makes you reject part of yourself. There's like a fractured self. And so there's parts of yourself that you just don't own. You just reject. And that doesn't allow you to have a whole sense of who you are. It doesn't allow your ego to be intact in a healthy way. You're divided against yourself. And the Lord showed me during that time, among other things, that was what he needed to heal in me. He needed to heal me because if you're divided against yourself, it's it's much harder as you sustain other wounds in life, not to just be crushed and kind of broken and, and shy away. It's much harder to go through temptation. It's much harder to continue walking with the Lord if if those wounds aren't aren't healed, well, the, the the courage that you just described to to not only um, take a peek and see it, but to not uh, run away from what you found, right, and to be humble enough to embrace your own wounds and go to God little little and in need. Um, I think of how in that in that process where you're reading and meditating mm -hmm. uh, how how different that is from our our idea of devotion and and rattling off prayers to impress mm -hmm. god and mm -hmm. to see how many prayers we can rack up to get what we need from him and mm -hmm. here you are he's broken you and he's led with you and you're going to him with need and he loves that so much and what did, how did this grace now draw you deeper into his love absolutely and an understanding you know with the brokenness like he has to give you that understanding and that love so that the shame can melt away because you're covered with shame when you're broken when you're rejected in your family all these things that i went through actually uh, it covers you with shame it humiliates you and you can't be humble if you do not feel loved. And so the antidote for growing in humility is taking in love, is receiving in the love that God gives. And the way that he set it up with me, I don't know, you know how this worked, but <laughs> the way that he set it up with me is my being at home was very much about receiving in love. You know, I, it's like I think I spent all day just receiving in love sometimes. That was what we were doing. And that allowed me, as I, as I received in that love, it allowed me to let the shame go. You know, the shame melts away. And it allowed me to be transparent with the Lord. What It, it was a gift, you know, a gift to be that little child. Um and I was, when I was a little child, I was like that too. I was a little child with God, you know, the way I talked to her and all when I was very young. And then I turned away um, for a few years from the Lord and he brought me back. But um, that part of that gift is just taking in that love and, and letting that love bring you to, how can I say? When you really know your love, really know your love, like every every cell in your being, right? It it humbles you. True love, God's love, doesn't exalt you and raise you up. It humbles you because it brings you into that place of realizing, like you said, Larry, that you had a great need and God has now come along to help with that great need and heal and strengthen and um and guide guide me i hear so many critical things that were happening within you in order in order for you know even as we talk about uh, mental prayer or, or meditation how how that for that conversation to be an authentic conversation you come to him as you are mm -hmm. right honest about what you need and who you are with him mm -hmm. in order for for him uh to to hear and and respond to you. So you're developing a communication skill and developing relationship at the same time, exactly. right? And just conversing. And and you and you're developing trust, you know, and 
And Absolutely. the funny thing for me that I that I laugh about to this day, so to speak, is in my revelation of God, the very first thing I did, you know, when when I talk with him is tell him how things were in my life, just laid it all out. And it's funny because recently I heard a Carmelite priest say the same thing. He said that when he goes to prayer with your a recollective prayer that the first thing he does is acknowledge how his basically how his week has been if he's feeling depressed if he's feeling anxious if he's feeling delighted he acknowledges all that to god first he tells god how his week has been and how he's feeling and and gives that to the lord surrenders that and then allows the lord to take that in as much as he can right so that he can focus on that time belonging to God, to to love God, to love God. In other words, to spend that prayer doing whatever stirs you to love. All right. So so we've talked about um, how your reading and all helped you develop an understanding of who he was and what he was calling. All right. And then you had this also the healing process. Very which much. was, you know, reducing you to honesty and intimacy. Absolutely. Okay? Absolutely. Now, for people, some people might have trouble, like, uh, if they didn't have that kind of a journey of, in a sense, um, feeling like they're with God, feeling his presence so mm -hmm. that that can happen for them. And we talked last week about some of those, well, little tricks, if you want to call them, that mm -hmm. we can use our imagination or visuals mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. objects, right, to to feel the the person of Jesus near us. Exactly. Speak us, exactly. tell us about that. And now in mental prayer, how does that work? Yeah, we talked about the importance of visualization in prayer and in the relationship. When the person is not there, you know, or you can't see them, then you use your mind to visualize. It was the same way um, when I went through a healing with my father and I had to just use my mind to visualize him sitting right next to me so I could talk to him and say to him everything that I didn't want to say to him in person. I didn't want to hurt his feelings. I didn't want to hurt him. And so I just put him there. The Lord led me and I just put my father there and just talked to him every day. And I could be very honest and very frank about my feelings about my childhood and, and his part in it, all of that, our relationship without hurting him and yet getting it all out. And that was when what happened is one day I, I sat down to do it and I looked over at him to to talk and, and it was it was so beautiful. It was like it was like there was just nothing there. It was like absolutely everything was gone. And I knew at that moment it, that Everything that I needed to say, I had said, and I think that's what I said to him is everything I needed to say to you, I have said. <laughs> well, that now that's fascinating because it kind of happens in the reverse when you have Jesus in the chair, that the more you say to him, the more real he becomes, mm -hmm. and the more there is to say. Yes, absolutely, and and Jesus was of course the mediator, Jesus is our mediator between ourselves and every other person, you know, every other person. And when you have Jesus and you're praying with him, we talked about, you know, you can set him in a chair over here. You can set him closer. You can visualize him any way that you want that helps you to stay in his presence and be able to, just what we're saying, be able to tell it to him like it really is rather than, how you want it to be, meaning whatever in your life, tell it to him as it really, really is. You know, if you're angry at somebody else, um, and, and I had trouble with that, even admitting, you know, anger, that was real tough. Um, getting to that point where you could say to Jesus, this is what that person does, and I'm really angry, and I want you to show them, and I don't want you to bless them at this moment. I want you to show them what they did. I've said that to him, you know, because that's, where I was at that time, I needed to be able to say that. And I needed, what's so amazing is also when you're raised, and this is this goes in with the idea of um, 
especially children of alcoholics and alcoholic families, but it's true in all dysfunctional families. When you're raised in a family, sometimes, I know for me, I couldn't speak out my feelings. I couldn't speak out truth. I couldn't speak out anything. Um, I wasn't allowed to really express my feelings and, and talk about them pretty much ever. Um, that was sort of an informal rule. Is I can't really explain it, but but if I had done that, it wouldn't have worked out real good, and I knew it. So I was not allowed or not reinforced, shall we say, or not met if I expressed a feeling in my family, and especially if I expressed any feeling that wasn't positive, that would, would, would have been awful, right? And I didn't, so I had to kind of keep it all in. So the thing that was so amazing in talking to Jesus is I finally learned that with him, I don't have to keep anything in. If I'm feeling something, I can go ahead and say it to him and know that I'm not going to devastate him or devastate some other person if it's sincere and I just need to get it out, right? And I have a, we have, I have a joke with my husband that whenever we go through anything with anybody else, I'll come home and I'll say, well, this person did that, 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 and I think this, and I think that. And I'm just sort of rattling it off, and I don't mean any of it. I don't mean any of it. I already know what I'm going to do, right? But but it's like a ritual. I need to be able to say to Joseph, this is what blah, 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 and I should do this, and another person might do this, but but I should do this. Anyway, you know, all of this, I just kind of go crazy with him. But um, But he knows now, like, that's my ritual to speak out things that I wasn't permitted to speak out growing up. And I don't need to act on those things, but I do need the freedom to speak them out. Well, you know, the other beauty of what you, I hear you saying, too, is that as your ritual with Joseph, right, uh, you wound up having that same relationship with Jesus in a divine way, right? And and the beauty of this that I hear is that as you were revealing yourself more to him, God's grace responds to that by him revealing more of himself to you, which to me is the definition of growth and intimacy. Exactly. Exactly. And that's what happens. And, you know, I needed like my, my image of God inwardly had to be a little scary because of, again, my background and what I saw just a little scary. And, and yet, when I had the revelation, I, I wasn't at all afraid. And I think that that took that basic fear away. You know, if we don't, if we're raised in a family where the male figures, you know, the father, the grandfather, uncle, whoever, are scary, that that becomes inwardly how we project that on God. You know, we kind of see God that way too. So I needed, I really needed to demystify God in that way because it's, it's almost like I was really saying, you know, um, I have to be able to tell you all this, that that's just a prerequisite for our relationship. That's the only way I can be close to somebody is to be able to share my real feelings. Yeah. Well, and again, as you could trust him and see that he was safe to do that with, and, mm -hmm. and you were able to be more intimate, um, intimacy and warming our heart and letting our heart start to feel affection for God, affection for the, uh, for ourselves, affection for what he's doing in us mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. is a movement from, from our head. Now, so often our relationship with God is a lot of intellectual thoughts, theology, mm -hmm. prayers, Absolutely. It's got to come down to the real part, doesn't it? It does. And and I feel like I feel like he was saying, I didn't hear these words, but I feel like he was saying, um, and, and maybe he does this with, with everyone, almost like that we don't know him here all the time on a human level because we don't always see God in our brothers and sisters, not just the early wounds. I want to mention too, you know, I, I focus on those early wounds, but there's also wounds as you're growing up and the same kind of thing happens. You know, if you get hurt as you're growing up, you may project that onto God. And I feel like, I feel like in my relationship with him very much. So it was like, he had to say, Lois, you know, you don't know me yet. 
but I'm going to show you who I am and I'm going to show you the difference between the divine love and and the wounded people that were trying to love you and, and did love you but to the wounded love you know that difference and I think he had to show me that he had to show me the difference so he was now also introducing you into a world of love right as and as you got to know his love for you and how mm -hmm. that love was lifting and freeing you yes right? uh, he was what turning your eyes and seeing others that way you were starting it's, to see others with love a slow process on that i don't think that was instantaneous by any means but um yeah a slow process of him revealing himself and maybe also the um the prayer you know the engagement in prayer like as jesus reveals his heart um what can i say i don't think he reveals his heart without giving you a little piece of it let's put it that way the revelation is the impartation of part of thinking the way he thinks and loving the way he loves just a little bit there well you know and I, you and i've talked about these fountains of of grace which are um to me like love fountains that that in baptism you have the grace and the gift of it planted there in his presence and the divine will it's his real life now like that in the fountain of of uncreated grace flowing up through you um in a way that we're still growing we're still learning yeah. still healing right and still finding out who he is and yet it's being expedited by his very person and life in us, mm -hmm. his very real life. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering um, how how that combined force is now it's moving and, and the fountains keep rising of their own accord, don't they? Yeah, absolutely. And that, you know, that absorbing in the divine love, um, he's changing you, you know. It talks about in scripture in corinthians 2 corinthians 3 17 actually talks about as beholding him the way the script goes beholding him we are changed from glory to glory and and i think that was and and is a slow process as we go through life but in prayer especially you know as we behold him meaning as we see him as he really is as we really see the Lord in that reality of who he is, just seeing that changes us. We are changed without effort. The effort is looking at him <laughs> and praying and focusing on him. The effort isn't looking inward and trying to change. But, but that's the change process. We are changed just by being in touch with Jesus and looking at him and attending to him and being aware of him. We are changed. All right. So now when we think of, of this journey and the prayer and the, the meditation, a lot of us think, well, well, that's for nuns and priests who have like cloisters and monasteries. Uh, you know, I'm not that. I'm a lay person. I got a family. I have a husband who disagrees with me, you know. And so uh, how I I can't do this, can I? Mm -hmm. And, so, and mm -hmm. what would you say? I'd say the, the church, Vatican II, says that you can, <laughs> you know, the call to universal holiness, right? So the church is saying, yes, we can do this. We can be called to holiness in any state of life because it's it's not about the externals. It's not about where you live or who your community is or how many times a day you have a chance to pray. It's not about that. It's where the heart is given. We have our own free will. And all of us have this incredible gift, the only gift we have that's ours, to give back to God, and it's our free will. And those living in the divine will, that's what we pray every day. Lord, you know, I fuse my will, my human will, with your divine will. We're saying to him every day, all I have to give you is my human will, and I want to fuse it with your divine will so I can give it to you. All right. And so that divine will is the power, the creative power within us that can do anything. Mm -hmm. But but my life, my life is like 
uh, I have all these other voices that say I can't, including mm -hmm. my own internal doubts. Mm -hmm. that, uh, I don't know if I can. I, you don't know me well enough, you know. Mm -hmm. And so how does your will, is your will able to uh, take all of that and still stay focused on this, this spiritual thing happening within you? And, and the key to that, and a lot of people talk about that, and, and I heard Rome Priest say that um, he teaches priests and seminarians, and he says, they, you know, they just want to serve God, they're on fire for God, but they keep falling, they keep falling and all these things like we all do, we have faults, we fall, we make mistakes, we all do all of it, right? And he says, they become so discouraged so fast. And the reason is because they have an idealized idea about what prayer is and what this journey is and they're looking at it like it's a project you know like oh this is a project i have to do well and i have to succeed and they're not understanding they're not sinking low enough and i'm paraphrasing here the second part's mine they're not sinking low enough to say oh <laughs> i'm i'm a fallen creature that's broken it's not really a surprise that I fall many, many times. But the beautiful thing is God is a God of second chances. So he just says, come back. Let's start again. Let's start this again. And I was thinking about that. In our cancel culture, a lot of times we, and I'm talking about just the culture, nobody in particular, a lot of times we don't give people a second chance that's why it's called cancel culture we cancel them out right and if you have that in your mind it's going to be very scary to walk with God because we fail many times so what we have to take comfort in is he is not the God of cancel culture he is the God that if somebody lives their whole life away from him and at the very last minute of their life turn to him, even just look up at a cross or just look up in their mind's eye to God and want him, he accepts you, he takes you, he He opens his arm to you. That's who we serve. Right? All right, so this this opening to him in the midst of our very real lives, which mm -hmm. include uh, not enough money or unruly children or my <laughs> own interior unruly children telling me all sorts of things about how wrong I am, Right, all right, all of this, and now I'm I'm kind to get to what mental prayer to to meditate, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I have all of that going on, and 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 now I'm I'm going to be I'm going to be calm like a monk, you know. How do you transition to into okay. that? Well, one of the reasons why it is so difficult, I mean, it's just so difficult for what we talked about last week, all the voices that come, the culture, your past wounds, your all kinds of things come, but. Why it's really difficult to in our culture is that we go very fast, we're very busy. And one person this person put it this way, they said, it's like you're driving in a car 60 miles an hour and then you stop all of a sudden, everything in the car is gonna keep going, right? And he said, basically that's what happens. We sit down to be quiet, but our brain and our mind and our imagination that's been going 60 miles an hour all day, <laughs> just keeps going we stop but it keeps going so what we have to do with that and, and Teresa of Avila is really good about this saying the distractions all the stuff that comes we have to really just let that go because mental prayer is not about being silent in that way or or quelling those voices and all that temptation and all those thoughts it's not about that she said it's about just taking all that as part of life and enclosing it in your faculties and just focusing on the Lord as best you can, right? It's like she's you. not real worried about that. <laughs> Our old friend, Sister Betty, comes to mind and she's just say, give it to Jesus. Just let it, take it like a, a Teflon shield around you and you just <laughs> let it bounce over to the foot of the cross and you give right. it all to him. Just keep right. giving it to him. And, and the focus on Jesus now, okay? Mm -hmm. So this focusing on Jesus, okay, uh, is calming. And it's also entering into him, right, who's already entered into us. Exactly. 
And and the beauty of it is, is it's entering, you're focusing on Jesus. You have all this other stuff going on. You're doing your best just to close it and give it to him. And what he promises is, is the scripture, you know, come unto me, heavily laden, what I mentioned earlier, and I will give you rest. So what happens is Jesus is making a commitment. You can give all your stuff to him, all the situations that are very difficult. You can give that to him. And he promises you in prayer at some point, it doesn't mean right away, you know, he has a timing. He will give you rest. He will act. He will work. He's asking you to give it to him. He's not asking you to solve it or fix it. Now, he may give you guidance. You know, as part of that prayer, I've certainly gone to prayer and had something going on and, and gotten the guidance of what I need to do in that situation. But that was still his intervention saying, okay, I'll help you with this. This is what you need to do. Or even more than that, this is what I would like you to do, you know, if you can. This is what I would like to do. Sometimes it's more idealistic. So it's like, this is what I would like you to do. <laughs> you know? But wow. yeah, he he is committed. He is bound by his very word in scripture, right? He is bound to help us when we come to him with a sincere heart and lay out how things are to him, asking for his help and his light. So as you as you're bringing all of this to him, all right, in in your time with him, where you're now just being together, all right, and talking like good friends, like mm -hmm. Sister Saint Teresa would tell us, mm -hmm. uh, there in the divine will we talk about as we come to him and and we leave our human will at the door. We we say I'm not gonna. I'm not going to follow that. I'm just going to surrender into you. It's mm -hmm. like an emptying out of ourselves yes. and all the stuff in our life. Exactly. We, we we kind of um, give it as a gift to God. Mm -hmm. And he mm -hmm. says that when we do that and then fuse ourselves with his will, mm -hmm. our soul expands. Mm -hmm. So we have more room, not only for his love, but perhaps more room for all those things that aren't changing in our life. Exactly. And this is also the exchange of what Jesus wants to do in prayer. He wants to give himself to us. In other words, himself, meaning the very depths of who he is, which who can fathom that, the very depths of who God is. He wants to give that to you and me. But in order for us to be able to receive it all, that's that receptivity, receptivity, right? We need to be changed. And so Jesus takes it upon himself to do the work of changing us and helping us to change so that we can respond in kind. In other words, what he wants is he has committed to give himself to each one of us and has already done that actually through the cross and resurrection He's given himself completely, 100% to each one of us. And now what he's waiting for and what he's asking for and what he's hoping for is that we'll come to him and ask him, all right, how do we respond? Show me and teach me so that I can give more of myself to you. When you give God your troubles in an honest and profound way, you are giving a little piece of yourself to him. You are starting to give yourself to him and he will take it from there and show you what to do from there. But that is the self-giving too. So, and the self-giving, as you say, with our troubles, it's our sufferings, whether they be pain or difficulties. Mm -hmm. And these sufferings actually are a grace that empties us. If yeah. we do our fiat, if we say, let it be, I accept this Lord as your will, mm -hmm. then then we've made more room for him to fill us mm -hmm. and give himself. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and that's the, you know, the the intricacy of the relationship you learn. And, and this is such a deep, deep lesson is you learn that authentic love involves sacrifice, you know, authentic love. And I was thinking about this. I was thinking, all right, think about the different people who love me. And the other day I was reflecting on that. I was thinking, well, would any of them 
like sacrifice? And if so, how much would they sacrifice? And then it led me to, wow, Jesus, his love, authentic, he laid down his life. And he says, that's the greatest love that you can have. So I was thinking, isn't that interesting? Authentic love, you know, really entering it is being willing to lay down your life for the other person. That's that's incredible. So he's done that for us. And yes. he says, what? Come follow me. Right. <laughs> yes. So is this process of of praying and meditating um a process of the of the passion of the paschal mystery of it's, of our dying to self absolutely. absolutely and the church teaches this it's an entering of the paschal mystery and that means that through our suffering really through our whole life as divine will teaches us but the church teaches us through our suffering we enter the passion and death of jesus and the promise that we have with that is Again, scripture from scripture. If we die with the Lord, then we will be raised with the Lord. We'll have the glory. So this is a dying and being raised, resurrected. And the resurrection happens in two ways. In divine will, it talks about um, every time we lay down our life a little bit, any self-denial, we are being resurrected in the divine will. We we are being resurrected interiorly, right? And and it follows every time we do something for someone, an act of charity, an act of forgiveness, whatever it is, we're dying to ourself. And as we die to self interiorly, our soul is being raised again, resurrected in the Lord, in his divine life. So we are foregoing our human life in terms of life being ego and selfishness. <laughs> That's our human life, right? We're, we're foregoing that. And as we forego that, our reward, if you will, our gift is to be absorbed and integrated into this divine life of Jesus. Well, now this is something that reminds us of our conversation earlier about how in this journey that is it is the tradition, the, the mystical tradition of the church, of, of the journey of the soul, and how this process, which we now do as God rescues us, and we love him, and then we grow with him, and grow to love what he loves, and want to just let, cooperating with that grace to, to go to out to others as we get more and more conformed with Jesus. And at the end, as you we will talk about in our seventh mansion, you're like, in the Holy Trinity, and you're just doing work, but but it's still within the realm of created time and space. It's still yeah. holiness, Absolutely. right? Which is high as it can go. Exactly. But then the gift of the divine will, the process is kind of reversed. You know, when we first receive the gift, we say, um, you know, not my will, but thine, right? It's not about me. I'm not trying to have a project to get to heaven. I want to give you my human will and just want what you want. And you do what you want to do in me, right? And so starting off that way with Jesus now in his real life doing it, we grow the same way we grow as we're talking in this journey. We still have to go through the baby steps. Oh, yeah. We still have to learn all the pieces. But now our, even from the beginning baby steps, instead of a, a, a grace that is affecting those in our own time and space, it's an eternal grace in the divine will, an utterly higher grace. And it's not about us at all. No, It's about no. restoring all things. It's about returning God's love as divine love. It's a, it's an utterly different journey with the same steps. Exactly. I find that amazing. It's amazing. Um, Teresa and John, everybody makes it real clear that these earlier purgative steps that you and I have been talking about in this series are totally essential. And I was sharing with you earlier, the other correlation to that, the other correlate to that is that your prayer life has a real close correlation with your conversion, meaning <laughs> your conversion has to be in place, you know, giving up mortal sin, trying to give up venial sin, doing acts of virtue, all that has to be in place before God, um, brings you deeper into the prayer life, into the 
prayer that we've been talking about. So our prayer life has a real connection with our conversion. It does. We are it really does. joined. And I would say, I would have to say that, you know, I know for myself, like if I see someone that maybe is um, just converted and, and maybe doing a lot of things kind of not not so control, not so quote Christian, just kind of doing a lot of things. It's real hard for believe, me to believe that their prayer life is real deep already. You, you kind of see those two go together, that as somebody grows in prayer, you yeah. see their behavior is changing and you see almost this, um, both things growing together. You know what I mean? It's, now, it's, yeah, I do. Yeah. And I hear this and I hear, I hear um, the people who are, or flummox they're they're trying to figure out they say well you know i want this all this good you know you're 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 painting a pretty picture but i'm not feeling those feelings of of intimacy with god i'm not feeling all lovey i'm not mm -hmm. feeling lifted up in prayer um and and so i i feel like i'm faking it while i'm praying Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, maybe I'm not doing it right, or maybe this isn't for me. And I think, you know, I think of how, how this whole journey is not based on how we feel. No, it's, it's based on our will. Right? Exactly. Speak to us about that. Well, I think in terms of the conversion and then the prayer, what I would say there is um, God makes it very clear and the writers, the mystical writers make it very clear when we go to prayer, there's a lot that we're still unwilling to do, perhaps, or blind to in terms of our inclinations, not maybe toward mortal sin, but patterns in our life, things like that. But also, it may be that we are unwilling to do what it would take, and we don't even know that, what it would take to go deeper with the Lord. And so in prayer, what's so lovely about that is you can go to prayer and you can if your heart is sincere if you really want this and your heart is sincere and you go to prayer sooner or later god in his faithfulness will show you what is holding you back from that intimacy that you desire with him he will show you right yeah and now you're talking about detaching from from things that are we're holding on to that are more important to us than God. Well, yeah, that, but, but that doesn't, that doesn't necessarily hold you back right away. Things that are more important because it takes time, you know, to make God as your first priority. I was thinking more of things that are contrary to the law of God. So okay, holding so. on to that would be the issue Not that so. would be holding you back. Yeah, God allows, you know, it's so beautiful. God allows us to come to him with a lot of stuff going on <laughs> that doesn't hold us back. But in the prayer, little by little, he is faithful to show us those things as we go along, but he still admits us to a certain amount of intimacy as he's doing that. But if you're willfully in sin and aware that sin has to have the will as part of it, and you're not willing to turn from it or giving up, then um, then you can't grow in intimacy, basically. Well, sure. That's, intimacy. yeah, and that's rudimentary in the very exactly. essence of our conversion. But I'm thinking, too, about even in those affections that we'd like to feel, that we can do acts of love that are just um, affections that we send to God, whether we feel them or not, we mm -hmm. mean them. Mm -hmm. We mean them if we don't feel them. And God mm -hmm. will hear and honor those gifts as uh, arrows of love. Mm -hmm. And his grace can come to touch our feelings right? oh, exactly. and to give us spiritual feelings. Exactly. And, and who knows that those acts, it would seem to me too, that those acts that we do without the feeling, without like, oh, you know, so wonderful, that we really just make ourselves do because we think that's the right thing. Who knows that those are not more meritorious than the yeah. other? In other words, that the Lord is using those to convert our own hearts. You know, to That's right. Hearts. And that can happen even in the divine will. Oh, that, yeah. that it's like, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. 
you know, mm -hmm. Lord, I love you, help my lack of love. Those kind of uh, aspirations, we used to call them, right? Ejaculations. Yeah. Those mm -hmm. are powerful and meritorious. Yeah. And as we do, as we know in the divine welfare, every fiat that you do, every fusion of your will, the letting go, right? Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. the, the grace, the uncreated grace pouring through you right. is also deifying you and participating in Jesus's own divinity by grace. Exactly. Right. And that's that's where all this is going. Oh, absolutely. It's a partaker in, in the divinity of Jesus and in, yeah. in humanity and divinity. He at some point he just shows everything. <laughs> he that's, just shows that's... his whole being, you know. And and you know, scripture talks about we're also co heirs with Jesus. And think oh, about yeah. that. Jesus uh, will get everything at the end of time. You know, like he's the king, right? The universal king. And yet co-heir means that we will all have a share of that. That's unfathomable. And as soon as we surrender into that, the, 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 the more we possess of God, we can possess him, we can possess heaven, all the kingdom of heaven and all the other is part of the divine will promise that that's what's happening. All right. Mm -hmm. Now we're out of time and there's so much more to share. So I ask you all, thank you, Lois, for, for a wonderful evening again. That was beautiful. And we want to go deeper into some of those elements of how mm -hmm. we get through that, how to become still, how to become regular in our prayer, mm -hmm. how to uh, let our hearts uh, e evoke the love, even if it's not feel, felt, but willed love and quiet and all the different gifts that God will start to bring us as we move deeper into this infused recollection that, that God's grace will now start to unfold in the divine will and beyond. All right. So for tonight, I want to thank, thank you, Lois, again. And I want to thank all of you for joining us as we, as we explore these things and want to share them with you and help you in your journey of prayer. And so we say just be honest with this Jesus who loves you so much. He is so safe. He has you. And he wants you to have everything, all of him, right? And he wants you to have all of him, right? In Jesus' name, we thank you for this evening and say stay tuned for next week. Tell your friends. God bless and fiat.